For this video, we're going to follow along the conservation process of an oil on canvas by the American artist Henry Ranger. And upon first glance, this appears to be a fairly tonal seascape, but that's not exactly the case. And I want to jump right into the cleaning process because that's going to be the most exciting and arguably most interesting part of this whole conservation. Now this was an oil on canvas that was glued down to a piece of hardboard, like masonite at some point in the past. And it was likely done because of some small damage, and I'll deal with that if I find it and later on. But really, what's exciting about this painting is just how dirty it is. There is so much surface grime and so much old varnish on this painting that as I start to clean it, we can see that this isn't a tonal painting at all. This painting is full of color, full of life, full of delicate, beautiful brushwork that's just completely obscured by this thick, heavy, darkened varnish layer. And so you can see just with a couple of square inches cleaned, this is a totally different painting. Now, this is a lot of old natural resin. And old natural resin darkens with exposure to oxygen and ultraviolet light. It degrades over time. And when it does, it turns yellow or brown or gray or cloudy or cracked. And in this case, this painting has so much varnish on it that it's almost like looking through a piece of tinted glass. And so as we remove this varnish, we can really get an idea of what Ranger wanted us to see, what he saw when he painted the picture. Now, as I'm cleaning this and as I'm removing all of this old varnish, I'm also noticing that there are a lot of areas of overpaint. And you can start to see them come through. And those are areas that are unnaturally dark on the sky. There's an area right above my hand right there. And on the left-hand side of this painting, there is a massive amount of overpaint. Now, generally, overpaint like this is done by an inexperienced conservator or just somebody who doesn't know any better. And usually it's excessive and totally unnecessary and needs to be removed. But I'm just kind of shocked at how much overpaint is on this painting. I mean, if you look at that left-hand side, just to the left of the boats, there's a good eight or nine inches by three or four inches that is completely, solidly overpainted. Now that is, there's a new layer of oil paint that's resting atop the original paint. And that's really problematic. Not only because it betrays the artist's original intent, and it's not original to the painting, but because in this case, it's the totally wrong color. Now, I suspect that whomever did this retouching, whoever did this overpainting, probably didn't clean the painting before doing it, and so they matched their overpaint to a dirty painting. And so naturally, when I remove the old varnish, their overpaint, which was largely concealed when the painting was dirty, becomes crystal clear. And that's a really big problem, because it looks lousy. Now, as I go along, I'm starting to find more areas. I just revealed one right there that are going to need to be removed. And my guess is that there was paint loss or maybe a small tear or a small hole in those spots. And I'll have to deal with those later. But first, I've got to get all of this stuff off. So I'm going to go ahead and continue cleaning. And I'm going to step back and maybe I'll throw some music on and let you guys enjoy this process without me rambling on. So sit tight. I'll be back in a little bit.
And so as we come to the end of the cleaning process, we can see just how much overpaint there is. Not only is the whole left side overpainted, but the whole right side, the whole bottom edge and the whole top edge are overpainted. And that has me worried because whenever I see that much overpaint, I have a sneaking suspicion that there may not be any original paint left. And if that's the case, well, I'll deal with it. It's not the end of the world, but it's less than ideal, and I would rather not have to repaint that much of the original painting. It presents a problem for me as a conservator and for my client who didn't otherwise know that this was the case. So I'll keep my fingers crossed and hope that there's something underneath that overpaint and it was just the hand of an inexperienced person or somebody who got a little uh, paint happy. But it is remarkable, the change, in just removing this surface grime and the old varnish. This is a totally different painting. And now, of course, I have to deal with those areas of overpaint. And so I'm using a gelled solvent and I'm wearing face protection and gloves because I don't want to subject myself to any fumes uh, or any off gassing. And it's important that I'm wearing a full face respirator because my mucous membranes, such as my eyes, can absorb uh, the vapors from the solvents. And so just a simple respirator won't cut it. I'm going to place this solvent on the area of overpaint and I'm going to let it sit and try to soften up that overpaint. And I'll come back with a swab and remove it to see how effective it was. Now my hopes is that this solvent will take everything off and leave the original paint, but unfortunately that's not the case. This old oil paint is really, really strong. It's really, really old. And so the gelled solvent can't cut through it as effectively as I would like. And so what option does that leave me? Well, scraping. And any of Buddy who's watched some of my videos before probably notices that this is a theme in conservation, that there is a lot of scraping, be it glue, overpaint, or whatever the case may be. We do a lot of manual work on painting surfaces to remove stuff that shouldn't be there. And there's no fast way to go about this. You can't speed it up, you can't industrialize it, you have to take it millimeter by millimeter and slowly work your way through. And in this case, I'm trying to scrape off all of, or as much of this overpaint as possible to reveal what's underneath. And the good thing is that as I'm doing this, I'm starting to realize that there really isn't damage underneath this old overpaint. That is, the original paint is there. There's no reason why this top coating of oil paint should be there. And Removing it reveals the artist's original work, and that's the best case scenario. It's not often the case, but in, in this situation, it's really relieving to know that there is some original paint there and that I'm not going to have to reinvent this entire painting. Now, I'm not sure if that's going to hold true throughout the entire painting, but where it does, it at least lets me know that there's a possibility that all of this darkened, discolored overpaint was just somebody being sloppy. So with as much of that overpaint scraped off as safely possible, and I'll get back to that in a minute, I'm going to face the painting with Kozo and a solvent-based adhesive. And the reason I'm using a solvent-based adhesive as opposed to a fish gelatin or another uh, protein-based, uh, water-based adhesive is that my initial tests have revealed that the adhesive used to bond the canvas to the hardboard is a rabbit skin glue, and that's a water-based adhesive. And so if I do need to expose that to any moisture, I wanna make sure that whatever I used to bond this paper to the face of the painting won't become soft or pliable or reactivated. And if I used a fish gelatin, that would be the case and that would be really problematic. So I'm going to be using a scalpel and some palette knives to slowly pry up and break the glue bond between the canvas and the hardboard. And in this case, again, I'm really lucky because this glue has just completely failed and it is so dried out and so brittle that it doesn't take much effort to break that bond and remove the canvas from the hardboard. Now, I still want to be careful. I don't want to put any unnecessary stress on the canvas or the paint layer. So I'm going to go slowly and I'm going to use this palette knife and I'm going to slide it under and twist it a little bit just to break that glue joint. And as it does, as I do, I'll slowly lift up this canvas and remove it from the hardboard. 
Now I could have easily removed the hardboard from the canvas with a router, chisels, and planes, but this is a fairly large canvas and hardboard like this is incredibly tough on your tools and so it chews through router bits and plane um, irons pretty quickly. Not to mention, I made some tests and I discovered that this glue joint is actually pretty weak and so there's not really any pressing reason to, big out, to break out the power tools and go through all of that labor when I can approach it in a smarter way. As you, as you can see, it's coming off fairly easily. At this point, I'm just slowly lifting the painting off. The glue has completely failed and this canvas is coming off nice and easily. You can see over there in the right, there was a little spot of light coming through and I think that's a little tear that had probably caused this whole painting to be glued to the hardboard. Now, as I come to the end, I'm being extra careful because I don't want this thing to pop off and fly out of my hands and end up on the floor in a million little pieces because, well, that would be pretty bad. And so now with the canvas removed from that hardboard, I can get to scraping more scraping. Now, I mentioned that this rabbit skin glue had failed and that it's just completely brittle and dried out. You can see how easily it's scraped off with a scalpel. And I'm just gliding the scalpel along the surface of the canvas. I'm really using almost no pressure. And I'm just allowing the movement of the blade to break up and lift off this uh, glue layer. And I'm only going to do this in part of the painting, and only in the parts where the impasto is relatively minor. Now this painting was executed on a very, very fine canvas, and there's quite a bit of texture built up. And so if you can imagine, if I press on the back of the painting with this blade, the impasto, that is the textural buildup of the paint, will create a bulge on the backside. And those bulges can catch the blade and cut the canvas. So I'm only going to be using this scalpel in parts of the painting where I know it's smooth enough to do so safely. Now the scalpel is a really great efficient tool to remove this rabbit skin glue, but it's not one that I can use all the time. In some cases, where the canvas is really thin and there's a lot of impasto, I have to use an ultrasonic scaler. Yes, the same type that your dentist uses on you even though you beg them not to. Now I've dropped the sound out because these tools make a really ear piercing sound that nobody wants to hear. Maybe your cat, but your cat is crazy. And from the last video, we learned just how crazy they can be. Now the ultrasonic scaler works by vibrating the tip of this tool at an ultra high frequency. And those vibrations will break up this rabbit skin glue. And it, this is a really great tool because the tip is rounded. It's not sharp. It doesn't need a lot of pressure. And as long as I keep it moving, it'll break up this glue really quite well. Now, I have to keep it moving because those ultrasonic vibrations can create friction, which can create heat. And if I keep it in one place, I can actually burn the canvas, and I definitely don't want to do that. Now, this is an incredibly slow process, as you can see. There's no big tool tip. There's no industrialized machine that can do this. And it's much slower than the scalpel. Now, I've been using the scalpel for 20 plus years, and so I'm really confident with it, and I have great control. And while it's the tool that I would prefer to use, sometimes it's just not the right tool. And so having this ultrasonic scaler in my arsenal allows me another avenue when my preferred method is locked out. And so, as you can see, just gliding it over the surface breaks up that glue really well. And what we can see when we remove it is a healthy canvas. There's not really much wrong with it. In fact, as I start to brush away all of this glue that's been removed, and there's quite a lot of it, I'm getting the picture that this canvas really didn't need to be glued to hardboard at all. Now, sometimes canvas is damaged and it does need a support, but this is beautiful canvas, and I'm definitely not gonna glue it to a hardboard. 
But before I can do anything more with the canvas in terms of its structural support, I need to extract any glue residues and flatten the canvas. And this is done on the hot table. Now, this rabbit skin glue is moisture sensitive, meaning that any exposure to water or other solvents may soften it. And so I can use that to my advantage to extract out of the canvas any remaining residues. I can place this painting face up on a absorbent cotton blotter paper that's been dampened with a release layer. I'll wrap the painting with a cotton webbing, and then I'll create a um, mylar sandwich on top of the hot table and extract out the air. I'll bring the painting up to temperature. I'll adjust the pressure to uh, what I think is going to be appropriate, and then I'll let it do its thing. Now, there is no universal guideline on how to do this. There's no rule book or recipe book that tells you what temperature or what pressure to use. That's all just learned experience. And really so much of what a conservator does is learned on the ground, not in universities. So now I'm ready to remove the facing and that's done with the solvent that will soften up the adhesive that I use. I'll brush it on and then I'll slowly peel it back and hopefully all of the paint is still where it should be and none of it's been lost. Now this painting didn't have a big flaking issue so I'm not really all that concerned but it's always nice to know that no paint has been lost. And it may seem almost unnecessary to take this step if the painting didn't have any flaking or its stability wasn't in question, but it's always better to be safe than to be sorry. And this is only a few dollars worth of material and it only took 10 or 15 minutes. So there really isn't a reason why I wouldn't do this step. And now I'll remove the excess adhesive with some cotton balls that I've rolled up and bundled. And I'm just gliding over the surface, picking up the excess residue. And sometimes you just got to get down to it and use your hands to rub off that excess adhesive. Now, while the painting is flat, I'm going to take this opportunity to do something that's going to pay off later on. I'm going to take a two part silicone and I'm going to use it to create an impression of the paint texture, the impasto. Although, I don't know if I'm creating an impression or making an impression. I mean, I'm not really sure which one I'm doing. One thing sure, however, that when it comes to making a lasting impression, a smile and a handshake just doesn't cut it anymore. I mean, everyone's going to go right to your website to see what you're really about. And if your website's an old clunker that doesn't work and doesn't look good, well, that's going to reflect poorly on you. And that's even more important if you're creative, where showcasing your work is of paramount importance. So go to squarespace.com, where with a few clicks, you can set up a really beautiful online portfolio, where you can pull your images in from Twitter, Foursquare, Instagram, Flickr, and other sites. And if you want to sell your art online, Squarespace has an e-commerce platform that supports the way you do business. So head over to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash baumgartner to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. And leave an impression that's as awesome as you are. All right, websites have been built, impressions have been left, everything is hunky-dory. And so as I peel back this silicone, we can see that I've now created a kind of a texture map of the artist's original brushwork. And that's really great because there are places on this painting where the artist's original paint has been lost and will need to be filled in. And there are plenty of ways that I can create texture that would otherwise disguise uh, and blend in and the naked eye wouldn't see it. But if I have the opportunity to use the artist's actual brushwork, why not? I mean, yes, it may not be what was here originally and we'll never know, but it's better than me just guessing. So I can add some release powder onto this fill-in medium, which is just going to facilitate the medium not sticking to the silicone. And I can press this silicone mold into it. And if everything works, and fingers crossed, when I peel it up, I should have a textural impression 
from another part of the painting, reflecting the artist's own brushwork. And now I can turn my attention to the structural issues with the painting, and luckily those are very few. There's just a small tear and the issue of the missing tacking edges. Now for this tear, I would normally use bridging, which is my preferred method for addressing tears, but because this canvas is really, really, really thin, I don't want to add the bridging material onto the back because I'm concerned that it might telegraph to the front. So I'm using an adhesive film, and then I'm going to be using a piece of silk organza just to hold this little separation together. And there's a lot of old oil paint that's inside that little tear inside the gap that I wasn't able to remove safely. So that tear isn't going to open up. And this is really just a precautionary measure to hold it flat and to make sure that if the canvas moves, expands, and contracts during humidity changes, that this doesn't open up and, and manifest itself on the front. So I'll use some heat and I'll activate the adhesive and then it dries really quickly. I can just press it with my fingers and there we go. That's all stabilized. Now, this painting had its original tacking edges cut off. And when they glued it to the hardboard, my guess is that they just sliced them right off and said, we don't need these. Well, I need them because I'm going to be putting this painting back onto a stretcher. And so I'm going to be using Belgian linen, and I'm also going to be using silk organza. Now, you may ask, why am I using both when I could just be using the Belgian linen to add a tacking edge? Well, this canvas is very, very thin. And I'm concerned that the Belgian linen, which is probably twice the thickness of this canvas, is going to leave an impression on the front. In addition, the edges of this painting are pretty weak. That's where the paint has been lost, and uh, I suspect there may have been some water damage in the past. So I'm using the silk organza and the adhesive film to reinforce about an inch and a half along the uh, tacking edge area. And this is done just so that I have a little bit more fidelity in this part of the canvas before I add the tacking edge. Now the tacking edge will pull on the canvas when I stretch it, and I wanna make sure that it's pulling on the strongest part. That is, I don't want to adhere it to a weakened canvas and then put some tension on it and have the canvas tear. So by doing this double method, I can ensure that when this linen is pulled taut, it's pulling on the silk organza, which is distributing that tension across a larger surface area than just the linen itself. It seems overkill, it seems redundant, but again, better safe than sorry. And before I go to stretch the painting, I'm going to take advantage of it being flat on the table to remove any of the excess fill-in material. And you remember that when I fill in uh, any areas of losses, I overfill because it's fast, it's efficient, and because I can remove the excess later on. But that's really an important step because anywhere that there's the original paint, I want to keep the original paint. And I don't want it to be covered up with retouching medium or with fill-in. So I'll take a swab that's moistened with solvent and water, and I will expose the fill-in medium to that and just lift it up. Now, because this painting didn't have a stretcher, I had to have one custom made. And this is a stretcher that's made of sugar pine, which is a fast growing straight grain um, pine that's sustainably harvested. And that's important because uh, I'd like to be a good steward of the environment as best I can. Um, and also because it's fast growing and straight grained, it has an even moisture content. And when it's kiln dried, it stays very straight. I don't want a stretcher that's going to uh, twist and turn and distort. And so I'll take the painting, I'll place it on the stretcher, I'll square it up, I'll figure out where it needs to go, and then I'll start tacking it. And I always start tacking from the center out because it affords me the opportunity to create a triangle or diamond of tension in the middle of the painting and then to remove any excess slack to the corners where it's much, much more easily managed. Now, there's a plenty debate about what's the right way to stretch and the wrong way to stretch. And, you know, that's kind of up to the individual who's doing the stretching. 
and this is the way that I prefer to do it because this is the way that I feel I get the best results. Other people may have different perspectives and that's certainly okay. There's not one right way to skin a cat. So using my magnetic hammer and sterilized steel upholstery tacks, I'll just drive them in using the pulling pliers to create even tension and make sure that this painting is well secured to the stretcher. And when I'm done doing that, I will take care of the excess canvas on the back. And using smaller tacks, I'll fold the canvas under and tack it along the back of the stretcher just to make sure that it's nice and tidy. And again, this doesn't really add much structural support, although there is an argument to be made that any more tacks will help distribute the pressure uh, of the tension. It looks good, and I like that. Now before I do any retouching, I'm going to apply a layer of synthetic resin. And often I call this an isolation layer, but it's not really to isolate anything because I use this same resin in my retouching paints and it's all fully reversible. So it's not really designed to isolate. Sometimes I'll use this to simulate what the painting will look like after fi final varnish is applied so that I can make sure my colors match. But in this case, because there is so much fill in material, so many areas of retouching, I want to make sure that they don't absorb the retouching paint too much. And that is, draw, draw out any of those resins and create an overly matte or overly glossy area. So that re resin layer helps unify the base for the retouching. Now I'm going to be doing a little bit different than I normally do. And I'm starting off with a big old brush. Normally you see me start off with a very, very tiny brush and use lots of little uh, brush strokes and little dots to reintegrate the losses. But here, I'm going big. I brought out the big guns. And frankly, that's just because there's a lot of area to retouch and it wouldn't necessarily make sense to start off with a very small brush. Now, I know you're thinking that I'm gonna lose some precision and I'm gonna be sloppy. Well, I'm actually going to not go all the way to the edge. I'm gonna leave a little border of unretouched area when I come up to some of the original paint. And really what I'm doing here is just trying to lay down some base color uh, efficiently and quickly so that I can get to that smaller brush. And the reason that I leave that area when I come up next to some of the original is because as I get closer and closer to matching the colors, it's gonna get harder and harder to see where I've retouched and where is original. And so if I leave this little border, I'll, I'll know what's my work and what's the artist's original work. And this is a fairly easy area to retouch because it's really loosely painted and um, I can go about it pretty loosely. It's not an area of great detail and it uh, isn't a terribly complex series of colors to mix. In fact, this is one of those odd cases where I have to be a little bit looser and consciously try to be less controlling because it achieves an effect that better blends into the original painting. And once I'm satisfied with the base color that I've laid down, I'll switch to a smaller brush and I'll start to fill in that little gap that I left between the retouching and the original paint. And as you can see, once I start to do that, it blends in pretty well and it disappears pretty quickly. Now I'll still come back to this later on after I've had a little time away from it and take a second pass and just make sure that I'm satisfied with the colors, with the brush strokes, and just with how everything is reintegrating. But not bad for a first shot and maybe 25-30 minutes worth of retouching. Now again, this was a pretty easy area to retouch. It's not all that complicated and like I said, it actually took some discipline to be a little bit looser and to be a little bit more freewheeling here, which is something that as a conservator, you generally don't get to do all that often. So it's a nice change of pace, but ultimately the goal is the same, to make the damage disappear, to reunify the image so that we can appreciate it as a whole and not see the damage and not have it disturb our ability to enjoy the painting as the artist wanted us to appreciate it. And there are lots of areas throughout the painting that are gonna require this same treatment, pretty much all along the edges where there was massive paint losses. And I would film those and show you them, but we're already at 30 some odd minutes and 
Hopefully some of you are still awake, uh, and I fear that if I continue just to show retouching, you won't be. And so I can start to move on to other areas of the painting that are a little bit more tricky. And one of those areas is the signature. Now we can see that there has been some loss in and around and on the signature. And I know the artist is Henry Ranger. Now I can't quite make out what this signature sa says. I don't know if it says Ranger or Henry or HR Ranger or whatever the case may be. And it's not really up to me to determine that. The problem here is that there are losses throughout the signature. And I have to make a decision about what I'm going to retouch and how that's going to be balanced ethically. So one thing that I will not do is reinforce, enhance, or complete this signature. And the reason that I don't do that is because when this painting is blacklit, all of my work, all of my retouching will glow. And I don't want to create a situation whereby a prospective client looks at this painting and says, wait a minute, why is this signature fluorescing? What's going on here? Is this an authentic painting? Anytime the signature fluoresces, it instantly casts doubt about the authenticity of the painting. Even if it's an authentic painting, it raises that question. And that complicates the equation for an auction house, for a dealer, for a gallerist, even for a private client looking to sell the painting. And one of my responsibilities to my clients, aside from making their painting stable and making them look like the artist wanted, is to not do anything that would complicate the existence of the painting in the future, whether that be at a sale, whether that be at a submission for a catalog resume, whatever. And so by filling in that signature, that would be a problem. So I'm just going to disguise this damage away so that we can't really even see it. And then I'm going to leave the signature alone. And so with all of my retouching completed, it's on to varnishing. And for this painting, I'm going to be applying the varnish using an HVLP system, a spray system. And I'm doing that because I want to get a satin effect. And I think I can achieve that better for this painting by spraying it rather than brushing it. And that's just, again, something that you learn by doing this thousands of times. You kind of get a sense of uh, what type of varnish and what type of application is going to work best for any given painting. So once I have achieved good coverage, we can take a look at the painting as it came into the studio. Really brown and yellow. A ton of surface grime. A ton of overpainting all over the edges. And kind of a lousy looking painting. But with all of that surface grime, all that old varnish, all that overpainting removed, the losses reintegrated, this is a pretty stunning painting and one that much more accurately reflects what Henry Ranger wanted us to see. Thanks for watching. Go ahead and subscribe and stay tuned for more.